I rise today uh, because it's my honor to introduce my colleague, who actually needs no introduction, but uh, still uh, for uh, this speech today, um, I have the pleasure to introduce Kevin Kramer, who will be delivering his official maiden address to the United States Senate. I've known Kevin for uh, many years, and he's always been an um, incredibly diligent worker for the people of North Dakota, and he's served our state in many different capacities. He served as tourism director and did a tremendous job of uh, promoting uh, our state, promoting tourism, and uh, really promoting the, the beauty and the history of our state uh, in a way that brought a lot of national attention and, and really made a, a difference in terms of tourism uh, for our state. He also served our state as economic development director, something that is certainly near and dear uh, to my heart. I've always believed that job creations are job one. And so, uh, to me, that's the engine that drives the car, and Kevin served as the uh, Economic Development Director under Governor Schaefer, my predecessor, and did, again, uh, did a fantastic job. And so he, he knows the importance of supporting our farmers and our small business, and energy industry, and all the things that really make our state go, and it's been a huge part of helping create an environment in our state um, that, from a tax and a regulatory environment has been very supportive of the growth and development of our economy and all aspects of our economy, as they say, from ag to energy to technology to uh, manufacturing and throughout the small business world. And, and like me, as a true champion for small business, I mean, we are big believers. Uh, small business is what makes this economy go. Whether it's North Dakota or the United States of America, it is small business that makes our economy go. As governor, I had the opportunity to uh, appoint uh, Kevin to our state's Public Service Commission in 2003, and he uh, followed that and, and ran and was elected to the PSC by the people of North Dakota and served as a Public Service Commissioner for the state until 2012. And certainly in that role, he was a big part of the growth and development of our state from back in 2000 when I started as governor. We produced less than 100,000 barrels of oil a day. Today, we now produce more than 1.5 million barrels of oil a day. The only state that produces more oil uh, than North Dakota is Texas. And Kevin was a big part of building, again, that climate uh, where the industry just developed amazing technologies and this whole shale play came to be. And of course, now the United States is the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. And so he, uh, he truly understands that you've got to help and promote that kind of economic development. But at the same time, there's a reasonable role for regulation and things have to be done right and well and with good environmental stewardship. Uh, prior to joining me in the Senate, Kevin served for three terms in the House of Representatives, uh, where we worked together on many uh, of our state's priorities and, and you know, share the same uh, belief in this, uh, not only our great state, but this great country, and certainly had a tremendous working relationship in the House, and of course, now I'm pleased as, to have him as a colleague in the Senate. Uh, we both served as members of the Farm Bill Conference Committee a year ago, and were able to put in place a strong <laughs> farm bill uh, for our farmers and ranchers. Uh, we both worked to rein in regulation, as I said, to grow our economy, to support our military. He's a member of the Armed Services Committee, and uh, also the Veterans Committee and uh, has already passed uh, a resolution supporting our veterans with his Battle of the Bulge uh, resolution, which has been passed uh, by this body. And these are just a few of the things that he's already done uh, as a member of the United States Senate. He's been a dedicated public servant for the people of North Dakota. Uh, he's also a very devoted family man. He and his wife, Chris, have three sons, Isaac, Ian, and Abel, and two daughters, Rachel and Annie. And they're the proud grandparents of five. Now, I've got him by one. I've got six. But, you know, this is a competition, so we'll see where it ends up. But he's, uh, he's a, got a great family, and uh, he's been a great partner in the, Senate, in the Senate. And, of course, I look forward to uh, continuing to work with him. So, again, I'm very pleased to today introduce Senator Kevin Kramer uh, for this speech. And with that, I yield the floor. Madam President. Madam President. Senator from North Dakota. Thank you, Madam President, for uh, yielding the time. And a very special thanks to my senior senator, my great friend, our former governor, and Senator 
John Hoven. In fact, as he went through much of my speech for me, um, I, I thought to myself, well, I could, you know, this is kind of like when I played high school basketball, John, and Kindred, and, you know, we'd be ahead by 20 points, and the coach would get me off the bench and say, go in and try not to screw this thing up. And uh, that's a little bit how I feel right now, but thank you for the very kind introduction, and most of it was true. Um, you know, the, the idea of a maiden speech a year into your first term uh, may seem a little odd, but I actually kind of like the idea. It gives me a year's worth of, of opportunity to reflect, which creates a greater clarity about the future and vision. And, and uh, the first thing I want to say to all of my colleagues here is thank you for being so welcoming, and I mean all of them. I, I, um, what they say about the Senate and the collegiality of it is very true. And it's not just true, it's really important. And it's something worth preserving. And I can honestly say, uh, out of the 99 that I've met, I love everyone, individually and collectively, and, and appreciate all that they've meant to me. Chris and I uh, have been married for 33 years. We, we have five children together, um, and I'm going to talk about one in particular um, in, in a little bit. <clears throat> Our children range in ages of, from 12 to 38, and um, that's too long of a story to explain. But, um, but we love and are proud of, of all of them, and John has named them all. Um, our, our five grandchildren, they're a little closer in range. They range from one to, to seven, and we love every single one of them. Lila, Bo, Nico, Chet, and Willa, with, uh, with, with all the love any grandparent could, could come up with. With all the love that God has for us, and I think it's important for people to know I, I, uh, I am a child of God and a follower of Jesus, and it informs everything that I do, both at home and here and, and uh, throughout life. I was raised, I think it's important to know a little bit about where you come from. I was raised by uh, loving parents. My dad was a rural electric lineman who uh, never once complained about going out in the storm to get the lights back on for the farmers of our area. Um, a, a mother who was a, a elderly a elder caregiver when she wasn't pumping gas at the local farmers union station. Whatever, they did whatever they needed to do to help us kids and to provide for our family and we never felt like we needed anything because we we didn't we were loved and we were well cared for and had great examples of, of culture and, and work ethic and values that are North Dakotans um, and so I think it's important to, to understand where a person comes from but I want to fast forward a little bit to this last year and I said I was going to talk a little bit about one of our sons it was a tough campaign you know a lot of people think that um, North Dakota is this bright red state, that everyone that runs there that's Republican wins. And while that's certainly been the trend, I think it's sort of important for people to know I'm the first Republican in my lifetime to hold the seat that I hold right now for the people of North Dakota. In fact, um, the names of the previous uh, senators in this lineage are in this desk that I stand at. And so it was a, it was a tough campaign. I got into the race late. Uh, really didn't aspire to be a senator. I liked the House of Representatives and still do. But the call came and I answered it. But what made the year so tough, fortunately it was shorter than most campaign years for the United States Senate. I got in late so it was a short year. But in the middle of the campaign or in the early part of the campaign, our 35 year old son Isaac um, became very ill. He suffered from, from um, alcohol induced uh, liver uh, liver uh, disease, and we spent a good month and a half in the middle of an already short campaign at his bedside in intensive care, both in Bismarck and in Rochester at the Mayo Clinic. And I say that because it was perhaps one of the hardest six or seven weeks of my life, the deepest valley I've ever walked through, it was also some of the most instructive, most informing. As informing as all those years in North Dakota were serving in state office, helping Senator Hoven, Governor Hoven build this dynamic economy. Um, th those several weeks with my son probably prepared me as well for this job as, as any. I got to see our healthcare industry up close. I got to get to know more about addiction and mental illness and how tragic it is, how devastating it can be, how consequential not dealing with it actually is. It, robs people of life, not just inconvenience. And so it sharpened those senses. But more than that, Madam President, I got to learn about our community. I heard from thousands of Americans who watched this very public 
tragedy play out in the public arena because of the very public job that I was seeking. And my faith in mankind was enhanced. My faith in God was strengthened. Learning that the sufficiency of his grace is more than adequate, not just for salvation, but for life. And it makes everything, shall we say, clearer, I think, for me today. Senator Hovind raises uh, the issue of, of some of my committee assignments. And I want to speak to that for a minute because he's a very important part, as you can tell, of my public life and career. Um, and while I stand on the shoulders of former Governor Ed Schaefer and former Agriculture Secretary Ed Schaefer, John and I both served with him uh, in economic development when John was the, the president of the Bank of North Dakota. It's John Hovind that gave me my first entree into, into elected office at the Public Service Commission in North Dakota, and then worked with me. And then, of course, I had the opportunity to serve with him, as he said, on the Farm Bill Conference Committee when I was in the House of Representatives. But when I had that very first important meeting with Leader McConnell to talk about what committees I'd want to be in, on in the Senate, realized I was coming from the House where I only served on one. I served on the Energy and Commerce Committee, an important committee, big committee, but it's only one committee. Here I would serve on three or four, or as it turns out, five. And the first thing I did is I looked at Senator Hovind's committee assignments and I, and I wanted to, to assess how can I complement where he serves. He serves on the Agriculture Committee. He serves on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. It made sense to me with my environmental background, my, my uh, regulatory background, to serve then on the Environment and Public Works Committee where both agriculture and energy development are greatly impacted whether it's environmental policy, whether it's land policy regulations that, that I think serve as a bit of a taking of, of, of a farmer's land are every bit as important as the revenue that they receive through safety net programs. And so I sought and received that. The banking committee, John talked a little bit about, about that and um, my role as an economic development director in the state of North Dakota. I've always liked macroeconomics. It's always intrigued me how, how you know, financial policy and economic policy go together. But as interesting as the Federal Reserve is to me, and it is, as important as the Export-Import Bank is to me, and it is, it's really the community bank, like the bank that Senator Hoven uh, comes from and, and whose family uh, started and is building in North Dakota. The, the local credit union, the farm lenders, that's what drives me more than anything in the banking committee. The Veterans Affairs Committee is a, a great committee and something that I could never have imagined aspiring to or, or holding, but I do know this much, John and I love veterans. North Dakota is home to only 750,000 people, but 52,000 of them are veterans. And in North Dakota, patriots sign up at a rate four times the national average to serve. So public service in the form of wearing the military uniform is really big, really important in our part of the country. I had the opportunity uh, for a number of years to chair the Rough Rider Honor Flight in North Dakota, where we raised the money and organized the trips for, for about, um, well, 500 World War II veterans to come and see the memorial built in their honor. And what a, what a moving experience that was. But before service members return from duty, of course, they serve. And we should be working to give them the best resources we can, which is why today is an appropriate day for this maiden speech as it's also the day that we passed a very important and very impressive National Defense Authorization Act. It provides those tools and the, the things that, that our military men and women need to be the dominating force for good in the world. And it's an honor to serve them. You know, I'm the very first member of the Senate Armed Services Committee from North Dakota. I didn't know that when I, when I sought that committee assignment to complement my Veterans Affairs assignment. Um, but I'm honored to do it. And the reason I sought that one, because again, he, again, back to Senator Hovind, he's an appropriator. He's a defense appropriator. I thought, how can I best look out for North Dakota's assets? And the Armed Services Committee seemed like the right place to be. I also believe that North Dakota's assets are perfectly positioned for the future of war fighting. And so I'm very grateful today for the passage of the National Defense Authorization Act and for the opportunity to serve on the Armed Services Committee. We have Air Force bases in both Minot and Grand Forks, and they're 
histories are similar, but their new missions are very different. In Minot, we have the, uh, the two-thirds of the nuclear triad in the B-52 bombers that carry those impressive uh, bombs, and of course, the uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are being replaced now by the ground-based uh, strategic deterrent. The modernization of our nuclear triad in this NDAA is very important to our state, and I'm honored to have been part of, of uh, seeing it through to completion. We also have a very important space radar station in Cavalier, something very few people know about. Very few people in North Dakota really are aware of that space station at Cavalier. And yet it's a very important asset. Now as we launch this sixth service, the, the uh, Space Force, um, again, we can see very important things and opportunities for North Dakota. We also happen to have a very excellent uh, National Guard, both Army and Air Force National Guard that does important work, not just locally, and they do great work locally, but around the globe, as I think every member here can attest to the power of their National Guards. Our ISR uh, systems over in, um, in Fargo, uh, flying, flying the, uh, the UAVs, it's just remarkable what they do. It's remarkable what they contribute to the national defense in our Air Guard in Fargo, the 119th, the Happy Hooligans. Um, and at the Grand Forks Air Force Base, as I said, a base that was similar in, in its founding um, as, as uh, Minot, is now a UAV base, a Global Hawk base, where they do important ISR work. And in the, again, the future of war fighting, the importance of good intelligence is so critical. And the airmen in Grand Forks are second to none in carrying out that mission. Um, so, so my, the strategic pick of my, uh, of my assignments, again, designed to complement Senator Hoven and serve the good people of North Dakota. I'm just going to spend a little time talking about my service in the House of Representatives because it is the people's house. I loved the people's house. Um, Senator Thune served in the House of Representatives from South Dakota, and he knows what it's like to be the only member from an entire state. It's got its, got its opportunities and it's got its challenges. I used to say to, to students that would visit, if you want to know what America looks like, go to the House of Representatives, sit upstairs, look down, and you'll see 435 people just, that are just like 700,000 others. 700,000 others just like each one of them. The diversity of our country is perfectly demonstrated in the House, and I loved that. But I also knew how hard it was, because if I could get my colleagues from South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana and Alaska to go along with me, I'd have five votes. <laughs> that's almost 10% of California. Um, that's, that's a lot of relationship building to get things done, and yet I loved it. There's, there are still things about the house I watch and I love. There are some things lately I watch and I wonder, but there are a lot of things I love about the house, and the founders knew exactly what they were doing when they created it. But to come over here, to be one of two, to be a member of the United States Senate, which is the equalizer for our legislative chambers. Our founders really knew what they were doing. And so to have that opportunity to work with you all to provide a level playing field for the people of a smaller state has been truly, truly marvelous. Well, I'm not going to elaborate on my years as tourism director, director and economic development director, and even on the Public Service Commission, really, because Senator Hoven's done a good job of that. I would just say, I would just say this, that the thing that I learned more than anything on the Public Service Commission. Even though I, you know, I carried the pipeline portfolio, cited the original Keystone pipeline, um, cited thousands of miles of transmission lines, uh, electric as gas, uh, oil, um, carried the coal portfolio uh, in reclamation, worked with the Department of Interior on, on, on those issues that are very important to, to our state. Um, what I learned more from all of that than even big time economics or engineering or you know, energy security, as important as those lessons were over those 10 years I served, the thing I learned the most was how important the people are. Because in the wisdom of the Midwest, the laws in North Dakota require that whether you're raising somebody's utility rates, siting a pipeline, siting a transmission line, siting a refinery, siting a coal-fired power plant, siting a wind farm, you had to hold a hearing in the community where the investment was taking place. In other words, you couldn't hide behind the pillars of the state capitol. You had to go to them and make it easy for them to come to you. And what I learned from the people of the prairies of North Dakota about not just life in general, but how to site a pipeline. It was a farmer 
in Walsh County who said about the Keystone Pipeline at an open meeting, I don't know much about land pipelines, but personally, I would try to avoid that quarry that you're going through. And so some very high paid engineers moved the pipeline away from the rocks and into better soil. It was the mayor of Park River who came at that same meeting to me and said, I don't know that much about pipelines, but you're going right through the aquifer that serves the municipal water supply for my community. I think it'd be better if you moved it. And so <laughs> high paid engineers moved it away from their aquifer. And the collective wisdom of the people of North Dakota and the individual wisdom of many of the individuals in North Dakota, I learned is something to not be taken for granted nor wasted, which is why in my service in the House and here again in the Senate, I spend so much time holding town halls of all types so that I wouldn't rob myself of the value and the benefit of the collective wisdom of the people that I serve. And so I'm, I'm just so grateful to, to Senator Hoban. He is a skilled and accomplished leader. He works tirelessly, and you all know that on behalf of the people of North Dakota. Um, and uh, he is relentless in his pursuit of things for North Dakota. He's been a great, great friend and a great mentor. I'm thankful for his partnership now and his willingness to work with me uh, into the future, as he did when I was on the Public Service Commission. But as we go forward, I do have a couple of thoughts about some challenges. As I talked about this accessibility issue, this opportunity that we have, particularly in small states, to know the people we work for really well and for them to have the opportunity to know us really well and to co collect their wisdom, I fear a little bit that the lessons learned from being so close to the people are lost in this town. In this town, not so much by members of Congress, but I am a fervent advocate of the administration and their officials getting out to our small towns and into the towns of North Dakota and other towns throughout our country. It's an area where I think the Trump administration has excelled beyond anybody. In fact, I believe this president to be the most accessible president probably since Abraham Lincoln, who used to hold office hours right in the White House where people could come in off the street and have an audience with him. And I'm not just talking about rallies. I'm talking about a president who visits the state to speak with leaders at roundtables, a vice president who comes to our military installations to meet with the airmen, an agriculture secretary who's been here, been to North Dakota, what, three or four times, John? Not just to talk to the very important leaders of the Farm Bureau and the Farmers Union and the commodity groups, but I'm talking about the farmers who get their fingers dirty. A commerce secretary who in the middle of, of, of negotiating with China came to North Dakota to talk to those farmers about the impact of tariffs on, on their markets. A Veterans Affairs Secretary who studies the alternative treatments being advanced and made available in Fargo. An EPA Administrator who lets North Dakotans continue to lead the way on promoting good waters of the United States policies. An Air Force Secretary who understands the air capabilities because she's seen them firsthand. An Interior Secretary who came to listen to the concerns of farmers and, and actually change the direction of certain regulations as a result of farmers pointing out how their personal property rights were being stolen by a federal government. Or a NASA administrator who observed the first ever university space program at University of North Dakota. And the list goes on and on and I'll spare you from it. But I think it's an important lesson and an important testimony to how good this country can be and how much better it can be if we listen to the people in the heartland. And all of this is why, Madam President, in addition to bringing people of, of influence to my home state so hopefully they can be influenced by it, I am concerned about the sheer magnitude of our bureaucracy. Now this week we're going to hopefully pass a one and a half roughly trillion dollar discretionary budget or, or appropriations. But I worry about the people that are going to manage that one and a half trillion dollars being so out of touch with real everyday Americans. And you can call it whatever you want. Some call it the deep state, out of control bureaucracy, misguided but well-intentioned public servants, power-hungry civil employees. Whatever you call it, I call it unelected, an unelected bureaucracy that has codified corruption in many cases. They've turned their own interpretation of guidelines into infallible laws 
place in the creation and implementation of their policies and processes above the needs of the American people whom, they lead, whom we serve and the elected leaders that send them there. I've experienced it many times in the six years I was in the House, but I've experienced it multiple more times in the Senate. And whether this comes from a place of, of self-preservation or self-importance, I believe it has to come to an end. A defining part of my tenure since the day that I arrived until the day I leave will be to take on a bureaucracy that I believe has run rampant. And there are several cabinet officials and agency heads that can attest to that statement already. Now, I'm not unreasonable about it. I don't think. I don't intend to be. But, Madam President, I am passionate about it. As I have made clear, I do not believe in the abolition of government. But I do think government needs to be more responsive to the people that pay for it. We ought to be giving the people a government that is worth their investment. And I aim as my highest goal at the highest level to, to uh, return the focus of the federal government back to the people. Return the focus of the federal government back to the people. I have listened to so many well-intentioned bureaucrats explain their process, explain their system, explain their traditions, and rarely do they talk about a human being on the other end of all of that. And so, I am committed to doing what's best for the people of this country with a very keen focus on the 750,000 North Dakotans whom I've committed my life to serving. Their individual and collective wisdom, along with their values, along with their values, as old-fashioned as they may seem to some, is our contribution to a great nation. And they would want me to say to all of you, Merry Christmas. And happy holidays. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator oh, from North Dakota. Me, excuse me, I would defer to the... Uh, I would just like to say uh, how much I appreciate uh, Senator Kramer, the working relationship that we have, not just here, but a working relationship that goes back many, many years. And as you can tell, he speaks very well. But what comes through is not only his commitment to his family and his faith, but his commitment to the people of North Dakota and his commitment uh, to the people of this country. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what issue uh, he's working on. He takes the time to listen to everybody, and he's always willing to explain where he's coming from and why he comes to the conclusion he does. But there is no question. Uh, he loves his faith, he loves his family, he loves his state, and he loves this country. Thank you, Madam President.